Boca Raton negates in our sole argument is baby got backlash. Currently, Sanger of the New York Times illustrate that Trump's strategy has shifted more towards offense with the placement of potentially crippling malware inside the Russian system at a depth of with an aggressiveness that has never seen before. Oh, unfortunately, Mitchell of the Hill in 2019 words that tensions are continuously increasing between Russia and the United States within the current sphere of geopolitics over Venezuela, missile tests, and military conflicts and are threatening to boil over. This is problematic as an increasingly aggressive stance against Russia can be the tipping point for tensions to spill over into chaos. OCOs push tensions with Russia over the edge in two key ways and first is by shutting down IRAs. Greenberg of the Wire finds that U.S. cyber operatives conducted an operation that took out internet access of Russia's internet research agencies. As Kremlin-linked hub of social media disinformation, Mikoshki of the Washington Post finds that attacks such as these act to annoy Putin rather than deterring his policy and strategy towards the United States. Will attacks such as these do little to deter Russians? They rapidly increase tensions. Barnes of the New York Times reports, these IRAs have direct ties to those loyal to the Russian President Vladimir Putin. As a result, Greenberg furthers that attacks by U.S. hackers against Russian IRAs, such as the release of Putin's valuable financial information, were seen by Kremlin and Putin as an act of embarrassment against the Russian state. As a result, Greenberg concludes that even small-scale offensive cyber operations against Russia generate an escalation ladder with increased responses with every violation. Second is infrastructure destruction. Currently, the U.S. is in the position to take action against the Russian electrical grid as Sanger of the New York Times in 2019 finds the U.S. have continually placed probes within Russian power grids since 2012. As a result, Sanger furthers that the U.S. cyber policy has shifted to follow an offensive strategy using these probes to create gaping holes in Russian electrical grids. Furthermore, Bloomberg in 2019 finds that new obscure legislation passed by Congress allows these cyber attacks to be conducted without presidential approval. As a result, the POC of the Verge in 2019 finds that UF offensive policy against Russia is currently being ramped up at a rate never seen before. Historically, we have seen this materialize as parallel of the New York Times in 2019 finds that over the summer, the US hackers infiltrated and temporarily shut down a Russian power grid. While the US may have intentions of deterrence, Nuparski of the New York Times finds that Russian officials interpret OCOs as an act of cyber war. This is damning to Russian relations as Greenberg of the Wired in 2019 finds that Kremlin has already stated that these offensive intrusions will lead to cyber conflict against the United States. However, Greenberg concludes that the only way to avoid cyber war is to cannot duck OCOs in the first place. The increase in political tensions has two implications, and the first is de decreasing economic relations. Current relations between the U.S. and Russia are on the decline. For example, in November 2019, Russia accused the U.S. of implementing attacks on its power grids. Peking University in 2015 furthers that for every 1% increase in tensions leads to a 0.5% decrease in trades due to tariffs along with decreased investment confidence. The World Bank explains that when trade decreases, prices increase, and empirically the last time prices increased and income decreased drastically in Russia, peaking of the World Bank reports that 16 million people were pushed into poverty. The second is retaliation. Historically, Russia has shown capabilities of shutting down national electrical grids, which is why the cybersecurity intelligence writes in 2016, U Russia attacked Ukraine's capital Kiev, leaving 20% of the city without electricity, running water, or heat during the end of a winter. With an increase of offensive cyber operations that anger Russia, the increase in tensions make the impact scenario of Russian retaliation increasingly probable, which leads Reader 19 of the Washington Post examiner to explain that Russia can easily attack national power grids, wiping out the entire Western world, leaving 90% of the population susceptible to death from starvation and disease.
The audit of the Air Force Research Institute in 2016 confirms that American-promoted norms on cyber weapons could create a framework for state responsibility, reducing the gaps in international cooperation that currently undermine global cybersecurity. Critically, the use of offensive cyber operations allow the United States to enforce these norms, cementing them into long-lasting and effective agreements. Smeets of Stanford in 2018 explains that offensive cyber operations serve uniquely serve the unique advantage of being reversible. Unlike dropping a missile or implementing trade sanctions, the damage of a cyber attack can be reversed at any time. This enables the use of cyber attacks as leverage, not only to punch actors that violate agreements, but also to incentivize countries to join them in the first place. This is because the Zirka Institute in 2017 explains that the United States has the best offensive cyber capabilities in the world by far. The headquarters of the U.S. Cyber Spy Division is equivalent to the size of a city, and America spends seven times more than China and 25 times more than Russia on its cybersecurity units. With America holding such a decisive military advantage, other countries recognize that it is not worth it to try to compete and instead settle for peace agreements. For example, Jensen and the Cato Institute in 2015 writes that the Obama administration placed cyber operations alongside diplomatic maneuvers, pushing China into an agreement that, with the U.S. that limited cyber attacks on key economic infrastructure. This strategy is being continued by the current administration. In fact, Trump issued an executive order a few months into his presidency requiring the State Department to develop an engagement strategy for international cybersecurity cooperation. Success has already been seen. Just last week, Reuters reports that Russia agreed to restore cyber cooperations with the United States. Ultimately, Governor of UPenn in 2015 finds that as the U.S. government has increased its use of offensive cyber operations, it has also independently shifted towards more multifaceted approaches, prioritizing the use of diplomacy and communications. Specifically, the audit furthers that America has increased its efforts to achieve broader international cyber agreements in recent years, developing confidence-building measures that address cyber conflicts with other nations, and signing agreements with Russia, Europe, and India to extend existing norms regarding armed conflict into cyberspace. America has also been leading initiatives in regional forums, tackling cyber crime through both the Asian Pacific Economic Cooperation and the Organization of American States. This global cooperation on cybersecurity is critical. While developed nations have access to funds and technology to build up their cyber defense, developing nations remain vulnerable. International agreements can alleviate this by encouraging information sharing, diffusion of technology, and from preventing attacks from occurring in the first place. Scholberg of the Norwegian Institute of International Affairs in 2018 thus concludes that a global effort is necessary to strengthen cyber capabilities in developing nations. This is especially important for developing nations, which have digitized their development process without ensuring proper security in place. A UN report found that unprotected infrastructure, banking, healthcare, and government services leave developing countries the most vulnerable to cyber attacks, which have the potential to trigger conflicts and put the entire development process at risk. Critically, economic development increases wages, creates jobs, lowers prices, and lifts entire populations out of poverty, which is why the McKinsey Institute in 2015 finds that over the past 50 years, global growth has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. For these reasons, we affirm. Um, can I see the Reuters evidence that Russia has really made a the last week? And then, like, I want to see the Johnson evidence. It's like the third card to me. Is that Johnson one? Yeah. yeah. We'll just take care of when we get that. So this is Jack Johnson. Hmm. Where are we going to go? Where specifically? Do I need to play this one? Huh? Yeah, we're just going to see the the Rouge evidence. Where's the Oh, it's okay. Yeah.
guys give us a card saying that in 2014 the U.S. is like increasing this agreement with Russia, right? Uh, no, the Russia evidence is from last week. Oh, okay. So like, I would argue that like, China and Russia, like, how many agreements have they had with the U.S. about like cyber warfare and like cybersecurity in the past? Uh, I'm not sure the exact number, but we say that they're increasing and that in the long term they'll be effective to limit cyber attacks and increase cyber defense and the sharing of technology to not only developing nations, but the entire world. I mean, I would argue that they've been like increasing agreements since like 2014, since the start of like cybersecurity, but you guys don't terminalize like what these agreements actually do, right? Okay, like just yeah, because just because there's an agreement, right? Like what actually happens? So you guys just say there's agreements. You don't say anything actually happens when these agreements, like you don't tell me the agreements are successful. You don't tell me what actually comes from the agreements. Two things. They've been increasing because of 2014 because of the United States' use of OCLs. We show you the direct link. But second, we say these agreements look like things like sharing defensive technology, the diffusion no. of information to prevent cyber yes, attacks. Yes, I agree. And more but you guys don't tell me why that's successful, right? You just tell me a lot of good things that come with OCLs, yeah, but you don't terminalize your, in, like you don't yeah, terminalize your impact at all. The impact is protecting the developing nation's development process, which lifts hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Okay. Can I ask you a quick question? Of course. So on your second contention, you said that uh, attack on the United States energy grid could uh, like kill 90% of people in the That's United States. That's our second impact, but yeah. Yeah, your second impact, yeah. yeah. So where does this number come from? I mean, I'm not the one who did the study. You guys like, can call for the card. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's from a congressional report. Where did he get that number from? I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah, so actually we have a demonstration. So he read a fiction book, found the number, and then after he read the fiction book, like he went crazy, he stripped in a congressional hearing, defecated on the floor, and now he's like a survivalist in the woods and he's 93 years old. So can you explain to me why we should evaluate this evidence in the round? Is this like a play? Like what, what are you guys doing? I mean, you guys read a fiction book. What? Like you your evidence a fiction is from a fiction book? book. Yeah, the 90% evidence is from a fiction book. I mean, I, where like where do you see like where does that come from? Your evidence. No, like where in the evidence does he say he reads a fiction book and then he comes I mean, up with a ninety percent number? In the congressional hearing, he cites a fiction book. So okay. can you explain why the judges should evaluate this as like your like quantification for your? Evidence? I mean, like Turner can address that in rebuttal, but I still don't see it. That's not responsive to the like the of the argument. Why should we evaluate a fiction book? Okay, what? Like, how do we weigh this impact if the impact comes from a fiction book? What are you saying? You're just trying to say, like, you're just trying to like. I'm just saying. We you guys can't respond to the argument, so you're just trying to like make sure the evidence like doesn't make sense. We can't respond to the argument. Okay, so like, why are you attacking the logical warrant of the argument instead We're of saying we read a fictional book? The judges probably don't know how to weigh this in the round, so you should probably focus on the impact of developing countries. Okay. All right, that's done. Um, we're going to run a little bit of crap. <coughs> right. Starting crap. Starting crap. Nice.
Let's start on their first argument. The Johnson evidence that we call for talking about superpower states have an incentive in order to create norms does not say that the U.S. initially is actually creating these norms. At that point, their evidence literally from 2014 never tells you in any way, shape, or form the U.S. has actually created norms. We would say that there have been agreements in the past. Sure, the United States had talked to Russia, China, Iran, all of these other countries, but they never show you that it manifests any decreased tension or any sort of de-increase in cyber norms. And at the point where cyber norms are inherently like nebulous and the fact that often cyber operations are also nebulous, we would say their argument is very, very hard to weigh in the terms of establishing norms at the point where their treaties have never manifested anything, there's nothing for you to vote on the other round. But moreover, on their specific link, links, I guess, their main link is from the speech evidence saying that these offensive cyber operations are reversible. We would say you can turn the argument against them because Bloomberg evidence that we read in our cases that offensive cyber operations are increasing the status quo. The reason why this is important and the reason why this reversibility of these cyber operations don't really matter is because even if you buy that there are a low comparative tension to other forms of military escalation, we would say the Delenic evidence, uh, Delenic in 2018 finds that it increased the probability of the miscalc because if we do more and more offensive cyber operations, eventually we're going to trip up and set off a riot, which we would say leads to an increased probability of miscalculation. The reason why this takes out their case is we would say when there's increased probability of tension, military escalation, or some sort of conflict, people are not focusing on creating cyber norms. They focus on actually winning some sort of war, winning some sort of conflict. They're no longer caring about what, what is going on in like diplomacy. But moreover, the main argument and the main reason why they have a link is they read this Russia argument and they say Russia has made some sort of agreement with the United States. Their argument does not terminalize that in any way, shape, or form. It says the U.S. and Russia have talked. They never tell you how that increases any sort of norms, what norms look like, and what they actually lead to. And at that point, there's nothing for you to vote on because they can't terminalize it. Don't let them come here in final focus, or like, don't let them come here in rebuttal and summary and try to make some sort of new argument. If it wasn't the case, it's really abusive for them to come and do that and terminalize it. But moreover, in December, or in, sept in like late September, the U.S. signed on with 26 other countries on the United Nations in order to create cyber norms. But the fundamental problem is the adversaries like China and Russia have, have continued to to go against the United States' ideas of cyber norms and created their own policies, and they don't agree with what U.S. and other countries are going to do. And this makes logical sense. If they're fundamental rivals, they're never going to want to agree on cyber norms, and they have a military escalation, they want to win some sort of global conflict at the end of the day, and they want to assert their global power, they're never going to have an incentive in order to come together at the diplomatic table. But moreover, we can also turn the argument against them, because our Greenberg evidence tells you that tensions are currently on the rise. The reason that's important is because offensive cyber operations are uniquely going to increase tensions and decrease the probability of any sort of diplomatic reaction, because we would tell you that if you continue to cut up offensive cyber operation and decrease Putin's ability in order to go and put propaganda on the internet and the U.S. is taking that down, that makes Putin really mad. And the reason why that's important is because there are increased tensions, increased conflict, they're no longer going to want to increase diplomatic relations and if the U.S. is violating their own cyber norms, and we would say Russia is going to do the same sort of retaliation and not going to fly, like, do the same sort of cyber norms. At that point, their argument has literally no historical precedent and no logical warranting as to why there's going to be an increase in cyber norms. But moreover, on their impact level, they tell you that there's a digitized developed world and they're super, super vulnerable. We would say that countries like um, India and Iran, or like, like India, have, a, have like really high vulnerability to offensive cyber operations. And we would say the US and India are probably some sort of fundamental allies, but China and Pakistan have continued to attack India and hack into, their, in, and hack into India's cyber infrastructure. The reason that's important is because the US has not done any sort of information sharing, has not shown that they want to actually help these like developing countries that they are allies with, then their argument literally has no precedent. And if India and other countries like like a lake, then we if they don't show any sort of like probability of them working together, then at that point their impact really doesn't manifest. But moreover, they don't read you any sort of terminalization of their argument. We would say our argument outweighs on a probability because you know there's increased tension right now, and offensive cyber operations have uniquely increased tensions in the past. And we would say that makes logical sense. They need no precedent of how there's going to be an increased probability of cyber norms. But second, their argument is not terminalized in any sort of shape, any way, shape, or form. If you have increased norms, they don't tell you how that terminalizes in any sort of developing nation that decreases tension or helps it like manifests in the population of consumers, and we would say it is a lot easier to vote on our argument about increased tensions and 90% of people dying as a cause of a cyber conflict. Because the United States has strong offensive cyber capabilities, other countries don't want to sign agreements with us because they don't want us to use those capabilities against them. 
They give a lot of responses. First, they tell you that our evidence doesn't say the United States is creating norms and status quo. That's not true. The Enoch evidence, which they don't call for, says the United States is leading global cybersecurity cooperation and is driving the formation of new agreements. Second, they say that this hasn't manifested in our impacts or our decrease in tensions. First of all, that's not true. Could you follow the diplomat? Our agreement with China in 2015 significantly reduced the amount of cyber espionage happening between two countries. It did manifest the reduction of tensions. And second, according to Symantec, the Budapest Convention, which is the only current international cybersecurity agreement, is providing support to African nations who help them build up their cybersecurity defense. It has manifested in the impact that we say in our case as well. Then he tells you that reversibility doesn't matter because there's miscalculation and there's more tensions. But yes, it does. We don't advocate using cyber attacks. We just say having strong offensive cyber capabilities means that we leverage other countries into agreements and we prevent the need to use cyber attacks in the first place. Their evidence is from 2018, but in 2019, which is last week, Russia agreed to cooperate with, with us. Obviously, we don't have a study that quantifies the effects of this. It literally just happened, but it is an unprecedented step that has never happened before. We say that our use of OCOs is leading to this. Then they tell you that the United States signed on with 29 other countries, but Russia and China are always going to go against US norms. The problem is that our point is that we push China, China and Russia to sign agreements with us. We already have done that. And they have an incentive to protect the economies of de developing nations because they do a bunch of business with these developing nations. But they will never give their technology up to developing nations if the United States doesn't do it as well. So that's why we say you need the United States to cooperate with all three. Then they tell you the United States has not shown an incentive to help developing countries. But they have. You know, Kevin says that the United States has led cyber initiatives in South America and East Asia. We say continuing to let these initiatives go into global agreements can help all developing countries. Finally, they say that we don't have terminalization of our impact. But they can see the United Nations evidence, which tells you that the entire development process of developing countries is based off of digitization, but they have no security, so it's completely vulnerable to cyber attacks. We tell you that this economic development process can lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That's empirically happened. That always on probability. That's why we have much bigger impact than them in the other round. Now, let's go to their case about Russian backlash. First of all, our case about global cooperation takes this argument out for two reasons. A, even if the United States wasn't developing offensive cyber capabilities, Russia would and others would follow, which means that escalation and the threat of cyber attacks is inevitable, which means the best way to solve is by building up the cyber defenses of the developing world. B, the best way to prevent cyber conflict is by forming agreements because you build up mutual trust and then there's constant communication, which means that A, arms races don't happen, and B, if they do happen, weapons don't get used, which is why, once again, just a week ago, Russia agreed to cooperate with us. Second, they tell you that Trump is changing his strategy to be more offensive. But just because Trump is reducing regulations doesn't mean that he wants more conflict. Trump, in fact, issued an executive order a few months into his presidency, prioritizing cyber diplomacy and international cyber engagement rather than attacks. And Manessa Northeastern finds that the United States has actually shown remarkable restraint in, in using its offensive cyber capabilities in 2018. Then, both of their warrants are essentially that cyber conflict escalates. The problem is, could you base the Washington Post, there's two reasons why cyber attacks avoid escalation. A, most are done in secret, so Russia doesn't feel the need to respond, and B, most countries are uncertain of their own cyber capabilities, so they avoid attacking them as absolutely necessary. But in addition, the, the, uh, it will never lead to escalation with Russia, because the United States does not have an escalation policy. When we get hacked back, we just let it happen. For example, after we hacked Iran, and they hacked us back, we didn't retaliate anymore, escalation empirically doesn't happen. Finally, let's go to their impacts. Their first one is about economic relations. First of all, they don't give a single warrant for why tensions lead to a decrease in trade. They themselves say that tensions are at an all-time high, but in the last year, American trade with Russia increased. Second, even with tensions rising, the United States and Russia have a political incentive to prevent trade shocks because throwing millions of people into poverty would be terrible for them. Finally, the evidence about tensions reducing trade is literally just said that if neither country is part of the World Trade Organization that happens, the United States and Russia are both part of the World Trade Organization. Then, on the second impact of our retaliation and the power grid, the damage can't be done. The EPA finds that the power grid is super decentralized, attacking one part doesn't take out the rest, and it's literally from a science fiction novel. Can we see the card that Russia and the US are increasing trade? Yeah. I'm just running quick when we get there.
No. no. Oh, you different graphs? Yeah. <coughs> so. so if the topic is talking about benefits and harms, when in the past have often society operations terminalized any sort of impact in the developing world? Yeah, so wait, what do you mean? So if you I read the semantic evidence that says the Budapest Convention, which is the only international cybersecurity cooperation agreement, um, that is lending support for cybersecurity in a lot of countries in Africa. Okay, so how has that helped them in terms of information sharing or it decreasing tensions or any sort of way? It is technology diffusion and information sharing. But has that actually manifested in the, like, the developing world? Because you tell me they want to do this. Yeah. They have an yeah. idea to do this. No, you don't tell me any sort of way, shape, or form that has actually happened in the developing no, world. I just told you it happened. No, you tell me they talked about it. No, I just told you that they are providing cybersecurity support, information sharing, technology to countries in Africa. All right, we'll call for that. You can have a question. Okay. Um, so, uh, if... If like an attack on the United States would kill 90% of our population, yeah. why would any country ever do that? That's just like, generically, if like um, power goes out for a very long period of time, our argument is that, sure, even if they're not actively trying to like kill 90% of the United States population, or just whatever percentage, since you guys want to make this end If it kills 1% of the population, why would any country want to kill millions of people if that guarantees that we retaliate the same thing to them? Because the desperate <coughs> evidence that we read in a bottle that you don't respond to tells you that as the more and more we do often society operations, like putting our like probes within Russian grids, that's the increased likelihood of some sort of miscalculation or tripping of a yeah, wire, which could cause... Miscalculation doesn't mean that, like, it's, 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 it's like, to lead to conflict, one country still has to agree to an attack on another country. That, that's There's not a reason why nuclear that's weapons were never used. Even that, though there, there was a potential for miscalculation, yes. everyone took measures to prevent okay, that from happening. Okay. Because that's not our argument. Our argument is that just due to like the way cyber operations work, inevitably you're going to trip up some sort of wire. There's going to be some sort of mishap and harm, and while you're hacking into a system, wow. and that leads, I don't know. You can call for the deaths and evidence. I don't really know. I don't really fully really understand offensive cyber operations, but he explains it right very, very clearly. Is the more we do offensive cyber operations, the increased likelihood of we make a mistake and no, no, cause no, no, this detrimental. Cyber harm. weapons are developed with a. You develop a code, right? You write a code with a yeah. very specific purpose, and then inevitably that, that code, code is not going to just like transform into something that like morphs and takes out the power grid. That's not what you wrote the code to do. That's what Desik tells you. Like, you're reading me some sort of logic. We're reading you empirical evidence that it actually explains yeah, why that happens. Logic happened. makes more sense than something you cannot explain. We both have logic. All right, we're not going anywhere. Can I have a question? You're not what? We're not going anywhere. Oh, okay. We're just like going back and forth. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so if are these agreements between like Russia and China and all those other countries, or is it with the United States and the developing world? It's Russia, China, and United States and the developing world. Okay, so is it just the United States giving like these offensive capabilities to the developing world Not or like all these other countries? It's information sharing and defensive technology. So why is that unique to them having offensive capabilities? Because that's the only way we can leverage Russia and China signing those so, agreements. So in a world where we don't have offensive cyber operations, we can still share our defensive capabilities to all these other countries, yeah, but right? We would never do that to why? developing countries because we would we'll be giving up an advantage while Russia and China have like, uh, like can still use their cyber weapons and find the vulnerabilities. So in the same the thing would happen to offensive cyber operations. Right. Can we see the, the Budapest Convention card? This, is, this talks about information sharing to the developing world as well, right? Yeah, yeah. Just check. Oh, 
Yeah. Sorry, that, that was like 25. So from the start. Yeah. Starting to uh, Yeah, yeah. So minute two, I'm starting to It's going to be their case, our case, and then Wang. Is everyone ready? All the judges. Starting at the top of their case, Sanush comes up here in, in rebuttal trying to frontline Turner's response and saying that the Budapest Convention shows you the norm of these cyber operations. I beg you to call for the card. It literally talks about the European Union and it doesn't talk about anything about information sharing. It talks about criminal records being shared. Their argument literally has no like actual topicality in the round. Drop them on the face. But more importantly, even if you agree that they win this argument, they don't terminalize their impact. What is any increase in democracy or any increase in actually helping these developing nations? They don't give you in empiric examples of these developing nations being helped. If anything, Turner and I give you empiric examples of how the U.S. is not helping India, and if anything, China and Russia are hurting India through offensive cyber operations. At the end of the day, it comes really damning from him when a noose drops the turn that we lay on their actual case. We read you the Bloomberg card, where we tell you that in the status quo, through the passing of these bill, Trump is allowing for more OCOs to happen. That's where you read the Dylan turn, because what Dylan tells you is that when more OCOs happen, there's more likely for miscalculation to happen, because the U.S. is going to trip up on these things that they don't know. At the end of the day, I would argue is that if you have an increase in tensions, you're probably going to be less likely to sign agreements with large nations when you are going to war with them. If we win that tensions increase by any percentage in today's round, we win the round because I would argue that their impact can happen when tensions are on the rise. But more importantly, they go for this Russia link. Their card about Russia doesn't necessarily say that Russia is actually doing anything. They signed it literally a week ago. You can't buy their impact. They need to prove to you that Russia is actually changing anything and it literally happened a week ago. Don't buy this argument, but then you go into their impact. Even if you buy their argument, they don't terminalize their impact and actually tell you what OCOs do to the developing nation. If you want to vote for a team that terminalizes any sort of impact in today's round, you vote for us under our first warrant. Group the first two responses that a noose reads in rebuttal because they can be uniquely responded to by the Greenberg card. All other in examples of Russia or like China getting mad don't apply because Greenberg tells you that if anything, the increase of IRAs is allowing Putin to become very angry. Greenberg and Barnes tell you that the U.S. is publicly releasing information about hierarchies and Vladimir Putin. This becomes really problematic because the only response that they read to that warrant is that we can't actually tell who's attacking and they're very private attacks. But we would argue that these attacks are very public and they're releasing information about them. At the end of the day, that gives us clear access under our second, under our first impact about economic relations. He comes up here saying that Ru that like Russia is increasing like trade. Read the sentence after. It literally says from 2016 to 2019. Trade decreased by four billion dollars between the U.S. and Russia. Their card literally tells you that trade is decreasing. That becomes very problematic because the Pekin card tells you that when trade decreases, prices increase, and people get pushed into poverty because they can't afford the increase in prices of food. At the end of the day, we outweigh on magnitude and irreversibility. When 16 million people are pushed into poverty, is a form of cyclical poverty because only nine out of ten people get back out of poverty. At, overall, we outweigh on magnitude too because. We give you 16.2 million people and empiric examples of people being pushed into poverty.
me show us the part in this part that says the, oh, the, the tree thing. The tree? Yeah. yeah. It's, the, it's just the same as that. It's US tree to Russia. Whose prep is this? Is that your guys' prep then? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. US exports to Russia decreased 9.93% while US imports from Russia. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Volume 2 or Volume 2? Volume 2. 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 Volume 22 seconds. Let's start on the app, please. Okay. Is everybody ready? Our argument is really simple. Because the U.S. has strong offensive cyber capabilities, other countries want to sign agreements with us because they don't want the United States to use those capabilities against them. Because of this, the Yonic evidence finds that the United States is leading global cybersecurity cooperation and is driving the formation of new agreements. Their first response is that there's no manifestation of the agreements, but the Syntec evidence explains that the Budapest Convention, which is unpres taking unprecedented steps to help in the developing nation, they say that it's just about policing. But we see that policing is stopping the cyber crime that is occurring that is hurting the development process. But secondarily, we just see that the Budapest Convention is at its early stages, and the long term it allows to help the developing nation more. Second, they try to turn it by saying that OCOs under Trump are increasing, which increase tensions. Two responses. First, they dropped the response that Trump right now is issuing executive orders to use OCOs with diplomacy, not to use them as aggression, which is why the masses evidence explains that the United States has actually showed enormous restraint when using OCOs. But secondarily, our argument is not advocating for the use of OCOs, but rather advocating to use them as leverage to increase cooperation. We see this cooperation occurring with the Reuters evidence that explains that Russia signed an agreement last week. They say this, Ru this Russian agreement didn't materialize anything. It literally happened a week ago. Obviously, we carry evidence that shows it's materializing. But the evidence says that it's taking unprecedented steps to building cyber cooperation which leads into our impact in the long term. Without global cooperation, developing nations are left vulnerable. The entire development process, which is based off digitization, but there's no security because it's just in the beginning step. We say that global cooperation facilitates the spread of defensive technology and information sharing, which secures the development process and leaves hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They say that we have no terminalization, but they drop the UN evidence that explains it's based off digitization. We secure the development process, which leaves hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They, we outweigh their case in three ways. First is on scope. Their terminal impact is 16 million people. Ours is hundreds of millions of people pulled out of poverty in the worst situations right now. We're literally solving intergenerational poverty for the developing countries. But secondarily, we link into their own case. Go to the top of their case. We link it in two ways. First, even if the U.S. stops cyber operations, Russia and other countries are still going to, mil to militarize, meaning they still have cyber, meaning cyber attacks are inevitable. Thus, we are the best way to solve these cyber attacks through sharing information and spreading effective technology. But secondarily, we see that agreements actually solve this conflict by creating mutual trust and creating agreements. A, we prevent escalation in the first place, but B, even if escalation occurs, we see it's never going to break on the conflict because they, they can only solve this through mutual trust and communications. They drop that. But on this idea of escalation, they dropped the response that the United States is never going to respond and escalate with Russia because the United States doesn't have an escalation 
Latter policy, meaning even if Russia attacks, the United States won't do a retaliatory strike, it's not going to lead to their conflict. On their impact level, uh, this economic issues. We say that tensions are high right now, but our evidence says that trade is increasing. They say that 2016 to 2018 tensions are trade decreased, but our evidence is explicit that from 2018 to 2019, tensions were the highest they've ever been, and trade was the highest they've ever been. But secondarily, their evidence about countries not being a part of the WTO. When countries are part of the WTO, like Russia and China, they have to keep trade volumes at a certain level. Um, on this, like, I guess dealing about like Trump is prioritizing cyber diplomacy. So if he's prioritizing like this, this diplomacy, and he's also putting in legislation to make it easier for you to do offensive cyber operations, which is more likely if he's already no, so doing he's, he's putting this regulation, he's, he's getting rid of regulations that make it easier to conduct cyber operations because we're showing our leverage to other countries. Where left, like that is their incentive to sign on to agreements with us because they know how easy it is for us to use them. So that's why Russia signed on to a cyber agreement with us. That's why China did as well. So like the, on your like only like terminalization and your example of like OCO is creating like this agreement that actually is like successful in developing nations. Like on the boot of that's not the only example, but yeah. The sure. boot of that's the only example you guys read. Like the boot of America has led cyber initiatives in South American countries. Okay, but the Budapest States. Convention, which is like the main thing you guys go for, right? So like, police, yeah. right, the, way, the card right. that you read us, like it doesn't say anything about OCOs. No. Yeah, we never said it said anything about OCOs. It says international cooperation has helped developing countries. Yeah, so but the how is that okay, okay. But the, the reason why we're really case. confused. Okay, the reason why we're really confused is yeah. that the impact you guys go for is it's centered around the idea that these developing countries have some sort of information sharing with developed countries. But if your evidence only talks about like policing, policing, and it doesn't even talk about like no, that, no, that's yeah. cyber, yeah. then it's, it's really hard to weigh your link. It's talking about policing because the Budapest Convention was a limited agreement that only covered cyber crime. So it was European and American and Chinese okay. countries. So but your link into your impact to take is out cyber sharing. crime. Okay, so our impact is that when you keep yes, but allowing the link to lead agreements, then you can grow these more. So link it to your impact so your that impact you guys go happen. for. So your impact doesn't happen because the link that you go for is that intelligence sharing happens. Our impact hasn't fully happened. No. So, so okay, all right, cool. You guys okay. have a question. I mean, we never contest that it's fully happened. We say we have the potential to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Okay. Okay. You guys have a question? You want to yeah. yes, All right. So, can you explain to me just like the warranting of like how people get lifted out of poverty? Because y'all just like assert that, and there's like yes, so, yeah. economic development lifts people out of poverty. You say it creates more jobs, it increases wages. Yeah, but how do but you guys don't like internalize that into cyber agreements? Yeah, okay, yeah. so the United Nations evidence says that the development process of the developing world, like banking, extending financial like systems, like healthcare, all that is based off of digitization. You can sure. easily hack them and take them out. But they say that if you have cybersecurity cooperation, you can help them prevent that. So, and then you guys just, where, where's this like 100 million? Because you guys never read it in the development process. In yeah, economic development, like undisputedly has lifted like billions. So, of like, we're saying, so, like, what, so in a world absent off the cyber operations, there are like these agreements, would these countries still go undergo any sort of development? Uh, not if they get cyber attacked. That just doesn't make sense. I mean, like, countries are still able to industrialize and like, build dollars, their economy if they don't have no, no, like, cyber security. It's not every single like industry is based around the idea that they have cyber cooperation wait, the and cyber US, security. The UN evidence, which is explicit, says that their entire development is moving to digitization yeah. and that without these agreements, ensuring defense of well, You guys say you just their entire sense. development you process. You say you're outweighing on scope because 100 million people are lifted out of poverty. They don't card that at all. We don't have breath, right? No. All right, Just right. a second. Um, it'll be their case, our case, all signed posts. Ryan, you good? Yeah. Okay. And judges, <coughs> All right. On their case, they drop a lot of things that makes it impossible for both of them. And the first of the term from Bloomberg that says, often the cyber operations are increasing right now in the status quo. And they also drop the definite evidence that that, that that's because as because we increase the amount of cyber operations, and inevitably there's going to trip a wire, which causes miscalculation, or at least some sort of Russian grid goes off. The reason why this is important, and the reason why it turns their case, because often the cyber operations are uniquely. The only reason is why there's going to be a decreased probability of diplomatic relations because if there's increased tension between any sort of nation because there's some sort of miscalculation, there's no diplomatic relations that are happening. But second, the this is a very, very clean, it's a very clean place for you to vote. But the second is that they, their agreements have literally 
never led to anything. They never terminalized in any state of way. The only like link evidence that they read is that the Budapest Convention has led to some sort of increased cyber operation like agreement, but it never actually talks about their argument. It never talks about information sharing once. So at that point, if the argument A is not true because they can't read your evidence on it, or two, they never actually terminalized in any sort of way because it hasn't happened, we would say it's really impossible for you to vote on this argument. But moreover, they we would argue that these are non-binding agreements. So there's no probability of them ever being enforced. But moreover, they also don't respond to the turn from Greenberg that tells you offensive cyber operations increase the probability of like Russia's information being shared, which is really bad, because they also don't respond to the Greenberg analysis that tells you that increases tension. The reason why this is really important is there's increased tension between Russia and the United States. They're not going to cooperate on offensive cyber operations or like any sort of like agreement. But then on their impact, they literally cannot terminalize this at all because their impact has not happened at that point. We can say we outweigh our probability. But moreover, this idea of hundreds of millions of people being pushed out of poverty would happen either way. They don't read you a comparative difference in a difference if offensive cyber operations. With that, let's go to our case. At the top, they said two responses through in. The Greenberg evidence responds to both of them. Greenberg tells you that sure, while tensions might have been high and they should decrease trade in the past, we would say uniquely that increase because it's specific against Putin and he feels like his like, actual like, perception is being threatened, which is why he says there's increased tension, why he's threatening war right now. The reason why that's really bad, we would say that largely increased tensions. Then they read that there's prioritizing cyber diplomacy in the past. We respond to this from the Bloomberg evidence that cyber operations are increased right now in the status quo, so we would say they're not prioritizing diplomacy, they're prioritizing offensive cyber operations. The reason why this wins us the round is because the pending evidence shows that a 1% increase in tensions leads to a 0.5% decrease in trade, and the Pinton evidence says the last time there's been an increase in tension, a decrease in trade, 16 million people go into poverty, that's 100% probability. Further on, our argument has been that because the United States has strong offensive cyber capabilities, other countries rather sign agreements with us than compete with us. They give you first responses. First, they tell you these two turns about how the United States is increasing use of OCOs. They can see maxes to both the maxes front lines. First of all, we tell you just because Trump is reducing regulations doesn't mean he's using OCOs more. We tell you that Trump issued an executive order to prioritize diplomacy over taxing the maxes evidence, which they can see tells you the United States has shown incredible restraint with not using OCOs. Second of all, our argument is that we leverage agreements using OCOs so that we don't have to use the tax in the first place. That takes out both of their turns. The second response he makes is that there's no terminalization because the Budapest Convention was only about policing. Yes, the Budapest Convention was a limited international agreement, but it did succeed in spreading information to help tackle cybercrime. It gave that information to police systems in developing countries like those in Africa. And in addition, they don't respond to the knock evidence which tells you. The United States is leading other cyber agreements, like the ones in Asia and the ones in Latin America. Our impact is happening in the status quo. That argument is just not true. Then he makes this new response and final focus that these agreements are not binding. But our point from the start has been that America's use of OCOs makes, like, leverages other countries to follow these agreements, which is what makes them binding. Finally, it tells you that we don't have a terminalization of our impact. We do. The McKinsey evidence, the bottom right case, which you can see, tells you the development process has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. And the United Nations evidence, which they concede, tells you that the entire development process of developing countries is based on digitization, banking, and healthcare. That is all based on digitization, but it's super vulnerable because they don't have security. Global cooperation facilitates the spread of information and defensive technology, which allows them to secure that development process, lifting hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. That always their argument, A, on scope, because they only affect 16 million people, but B, it also weighs their argument on the two links in that go conceded. A, we tell you that even if the United States is developing offensive cyber capabilities, Russia will be doing it, which makes escalation inevitable. The best way to protect against that is by building up the defense. And B, we tell you the best way to prevent cyber conflict is by forming agreements. Russia agreed to cooperate with us on cybersecurity, which takes out their entire case. But the impact response that they don't respond to tells you that in 2018, when we had the highest tensions with Russia and the United States, like they tell themselves in your case, trade increase. Their argument is just not materializing in the real world.